Remember that cricket is a funny game. A hundred years before we protected our heads, players looked after their groin. So don't be as stupid as old cricketers. Protect your computer. NordVPN is the protection I use when facing cyber shortfalls or when the rights issue tried to dismiss me. NordVPN will help you get through the straight bat of any GEO blocks so you can watch all the cricket you want. If you need your pitch changed, well, NordVPN can doctor any surface to a new location so your IP address is set up for you to win. Want to buy an associate cricket shirt from a place that won't ship to your country? Select NordVPN. Want to watch a game on a free stream in another hemisphere? Give NordVPN the ball. Or if you just want to watch a clip on social media that the cricket board won't allow, promote NordVPN to pinch it. So if you need a VPN, go Nord. Use nordvpn.com forward slash Kimba to get a huge discount off your Nord VPN plan plus four additional months for free. It's completely risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. The link is in the show notes. Protect your computer like a cricketer protects their nether region with Nord VPN today. Morning, everyone, and welcome to Wagon Wheel, the podcast where we answer your questions on cricket, and especially if you've asked them on Patreon beforehand, which is Jared Kim. No, it's not jaredkimber.com. I don't know if I even own jaredkimber.com. Maybe I do. It's patreon.com forward slash Jared Kimber. And you can go over there and you can sign up like so many people have. But if you want to ask them in the chat, feel free to do that as well. I see a couple of people already have asked with super chats, but to start the show, Let's go with Ibik, who says, who are examples of pro players that used to play indoor cricket? War Brothers, Ty, Warner come to mind. Do you think there are any skills from it that translate well to regular cricket, uh, particularly for professionals? Um, I think Ian O'Brien and Shane Harwood are the two guys in men's cricket that I know have played, um, uh, have represented their countries in both uh, indoor and outdoor cricket. I'm trying to think if there's anyone else. Um, I know there's some other women, but I can't remember their names, but I think there's a couple of women players that have done it as well. Um, Michael Clark's family owned an indoor centre, didn't they? So I'm assuming he played a lot of indoor cricket when, when he first um, came through. Look, it is very different. Um, I suppose running between rick- wickets maybe is is one thing that you get very, very good at perhaps. Um, you're doing that a lot in indoor cricket, aren't you? Um, for those that don't know, I've got an indoor cricket ball over here somewhere, but it's essentially a tennis ball wrapped in a case like a cricket ball. Uh, it helps you with wrist position, although indoor balls do uh, swing violently. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it's like futsal or something, but I do think there are elements, especially as T20 cricket comes along, where indoor cricket could be quite helpful. You know. Um, but there, you know, it's not the same game. I think that's very, very fair to say. It's an interesting question, though. So, I mean, Nathan says, in soccer during a League Cup final, Kepa from Chelsea FC refused to be sub- substituted even when his number came up. Combatters refused to come off the field even if the captain declares. Now, once the captain has declared, uh, you uh, the innings is closed. Um, but I don't think a captain can make you retire out. I'm pretty sure I'm right in that. I'd have to go back and check check the uh, laws, but my memory is that you the the batter has to decide to be retire out. Doesn't mean that the captain can't tell them to do it, but yeah, a, a declaration uh, essentially uh, it is ends the inning. So it doesn't matter if you want to stay out there and bat or not. Like the innings is over. Another one from Sammy Nathan who says, "What would Kumble's record be if he had bowled with DRS? Since he was a stump to stump bowler, would he have finished with more wickets than Murley Warren and Jimmy?" Well, the truth is that Warren and Murley would have worked that out as well. So Murley would have bowled around the wicket a lot more. And I reckon Warren would have bowled a wider of the crease and pitched the ball in line and straightened it because we've already seen with Warren that he definitely worked out um, DRS uh, towards the back end of his career. And with Murley, we know that he goes from being ordinary against left-handers to being, you know, uh, probably the greatest bowler of all time against left-handers. So I think in, in that case, Kumble is more set up to automatically bowl on DRS, but I don't think that means that those other guys wouldn't. So there's no doubt that Kumble would have done brilliantly in the modern era because of what you're talking about, you know, keeping the stumps in play. Uh, you know, the, the I mean, I think Warren probably missed out on a lot of LBWs, but I can only imagine that Kumble missed out on even more. But we saw bo- probably both guys work out that system as they went on. Um, so if the other two had the 
you know, if, if Kumble is the only one who believed in the DRS system under this, then yes, it would have helped him more. But if everyone was playing in the DRS system, then those other guys would have got more wickets as well. Vika says, Gil and Jaiswal are three format players and they're playing the IPL. Uh, probably future IPL captains. That will make them super busy and less time to work on their game. It'll be very hard for them to have a long career then. And if India will have a lot of all format players in their 11 teams, um, like New Zealand, Pakistan, South Africa can give them good competition in the world stage because they have lots of specialist format players. I think India shouldn't pick any player for more than two formats. Um, I think it's hard to make a prediction on what cricket is going to be like in five or 10 years time because it, or everything you've just said could become completely moot. Um, I, I understand your general principle, but at the moment, Especially in test cricket, I, I think the best players are still the best players. We do occasionally see players maybe fall back slightly when they've been focusing on their white ball cricket. Maybe jo perhaps Josh Hazelwood is the best example of that in test cricket. Um, so I do understand your, your specialist argument. But if India is producing players that are so much better than other countries, then even if those players are not always playing at you know the, the best, uh, they're going to be pretty good. However, you know, would Jimmy Anderson be doing what Jimmy Anderson's doing now if if he hadn't given up, you know, one-day cricket nine years ago, whenever it was? Um, so there is an argument for for what you're saying as well. Um, I don't think the Indian all-format players are playing as much as some of the other all-format players in the world, though. I, I could be wrong. I'd have to have a, go back and have a look at the actual days. Um, so... I think in the future, I get your point, but do you real, do you want a batter who is, I don't know, let's say 12% worse than Jaiswal opening the batting instead of Jaiswal when you're going to a World Cup? No. You What you would probably do is do what teams already do, which is they rest and rotate their players throughout bilaterals. And then as, you know, look at Stokes. No one, none of us believed that Stokes wasn't going to play in that last World Cup. We all thought what happened would happen. Um, we've seen it with the Australian bowlers before too, not playing a lot of cricket and then suddenly, oh, to World Cup, they're all back and they're all playing again. Um, so I think there'll be more of that sort of stuff in the short term than anything else. Vikas says, Australia's batting looks so weak to me and to anyone with eyes. It would be very hard for them to uh, win a Border Gavaska trophy. Uh, what do you think of... Um, okay, that was a statement, not a question. Uh, what do you think of Stark? I think he's not the bowler he used to be. He has a bowling average close to 30 in the last three years. He only takes wickets with the newish ball or tail end of wickets. <laughs> I mean, that's <laughs> that's always been the knock on, on Stark. Um, I actually think he's developed his bowling uh, quite a bit. The, the question isn't, should they drop Stark? The question is, is there a better bowler than Stark outside the team? Right? Um, so... Can you name the bowler who you think is going to come in and is going to give them the two things that you've just said? You know, incredible explosiveness with the new ball and then the ability to reverse it and then also just to go through tails. If that bowler's out there and they can replace him, they should replace him. My guess is that's probably not the case. Um, and I think we've seen Hazelwood slip back at times. You know, Lions come through in sort of waves at different times as well. They're probably still the best four bowlers in Australia and, you know, I, I don't see anyone out there who is better unless Spencer Johnson is gets everything right and, and you know, just comes in and changes things. I don't see any reason for them to move on from Stark at the moment. William says, why are crowds in Nepal so good compared to even some full member nations? Um, I'm, I'm not an expert in, uh, in uh, uh, Nepal cricket, if we're being honest. Um, I know a little bit about it. But essentially what happens is they come to cricket and they don't have a lot of other top level sports that they're very good at. And they do have some, some success in cricket. And I think there is maybe more of a, there may be more of a cricket environment than perhaps some other teams that, that come to cricket and it does explode. I think it's also settled down a little bit more now. I think before it was like almost every cricket game that was played over there had these incredible um, crowds. But yeah, I do think it would be interesting to see what sort of crowds you would get for Afghanistan as well, right? Like I would assume it would be quite similar. Um, if they were playing at home uh, uh, regularly and, and had, you know, better, if all their best players were available to them at home. But I don't know. Uh, but yes, I think I think it was just, I, I don't want to say a, fl a fluke of nature, but I, I think it's one of those situations where 
there was a clearly something was building in their country there was an interest there and then it became a bit of an obsession for a, for a long period of time but i don't know if there's anything that is um uh that is replicable i see that you say here that um um how can world, world cricket ensure that this enthusiasm doesn't dissipate um i mean essentially nepal have to keep playing good cricket right like I don't think that's any different than anywhere else. They have to get to World Cups. They have to start performing at World Cups. They've kind of, I don't want to say underperformed because I think that's unfair. They've had lots of problems with their administration, of course. Uh, you know, the Sandeep Lamachani uh, problem is is widely known. Paris Kadka probably retired a little bit too early. There's issues with uh, uh, Nepalese cricket that do need to be over, overcome. But the talent is there and the passion is there. So you kind of assume a little bit like Bangladesh that they can overcome other issues and at least make it to that next level. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating one. I've, uh, I think when they had the Everest T20 League, I think I was asked if I wanted to go and I, I think I'd already got another job with someone else and I couldn't go over at the time. But I would love to go over there and ha have a look at how those things work over there because it, it is really f fascinating. I'm sure Paris would take me around as well. Uh, GD says, Consensus is baseball needs to evolve. What do you think baseball 2.0 should look like? Play to your strengths, but within more situational awareness. Bring back someone like Keaton Jennings at number three. Um, uh, or drop Bairstow for Brook. Uh, drop folks and, and toss the gloves to one of the Ollies who bat down the order. So I think they'll bring in another wicketkeeper for folks. Uh, my guess is that Brook um, will come into the side. Like, I think he would have been in that side had they had the ability uh, to do that already. I don't think we're going to see anyone like Keaton Jennings. I don't think it's, for me, it's not really about selection because the, other than Brooke, there isn't like a bunch of players who I think are going to change their trajectory. I think it's more about, it goes back to your original thing of play to your strengths, but with more situational awareness. So I, I think team, uh, you know, if you are telling everyone exactly what you're going to do in every situation, the other teams can game plan for that. So perhaps occasionally they should go against type right and then occasionally they should go all in on you know when it's algorithmically in their favor when there's no other choice or anything else uh i just think making smart decisions i think they got sucked up in the ego of it and they stopped making smart decisions it's a smart tactic right it's not a smart tactic if you do it every single time no matter what the context is that's just spamming right and so at a certain point you just have to tweak it a little bit Uh, GD says, what was the funniest moment from the last test court on the stump, Mike? Uh, Bummer, I'm wondering how Zach Crawley was still not out. I did enjoy that, by the way. Gil Anderson, Bearstow sledging. Uh, Bashir trying to review a bold or anything else I missed. I, I like the, um, I, and I didn't, I don't speak Hindi, obviously, but I did like that they started sledging Bashir in Hindi. I don't, I think that was the first test I noticed it. Um, and he was laughing back at them, which I thought was, I thought that was really cool as well. But yeah, I, look, I love stump, Mike. I, I know the players are, not particularly pro it uh, and they get a little bit upset at times at, at it and how it works. And, and I understand that, but I think it's brilliant for cricket. I think it's a, you know, an awesome development for the game. Um, and, you know, if that means occasionally a player is going to get caught in the heat of the moment, well, that's fine. There are many other sports in the world where we can hear what they say anyway, right? Like if you're on a tennis court or a basketball court, um, you know, you have to mind what you say anyway. So I do think the uh, the idea of having uh, microphones around is just part of professional sport anyway, and they should have to deal with it. Uh, but yeah, I thought I thought you I think you're right, Judy. It was a very funny test match from that perspective. Ian says there was a brilliant post match interview with Ashwin after the win over England, where he spoke about how much he changes and alters his approach during and between games depending on conditions. He's clearly a brilliant player and thinker on the game. Do you think India picking him irregularly in the last few years has benefited him by keeping him fresh or has it stopped him from being on 600 odd wickets? Yeah, I think it stopped him from being on 600 odd wickets. I think if you go back, I think I wrote this in 2012. I thought he bowled magnificently in Australia in 2012 and didn't get the wickets. And that kind of spooked them about using him overseas. And obviously, Judasia complicates things and everything else. Judasia is probably the bigger reason he hasn't played more overseas. Um, but I thought he had a good series in Australia. I thought the ball came out of his hand well. He put it in the right areas. He asked questions of, of, of the players. And then they really didn't play him that much overseas outside of Asian conditions for a long time. I actually think that slowed down his development. Now, the other argument 
you're making here, Ian, is maybe it makes him more fresh, which is also very, very fair. Um, but I think he would be even better now. I mean, maybe he would be worse physically, but better um, in terms of wickets and technically if he if he spent more time um, uh, on pitches that didn't suit him. It's just some players just need to be on pitches that don't suit them. That it actually helps them better because it 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 broadens their game. Uh, actually, I'll just put this out of way. I'll just put this question away, and we'll take a quick ad break here. I'm Jared Kimber, and this is the Wagon Wheel. And after this, quick note from our sponsors. We will be back in a moment with more of the quicker questions on this podcast. Just absolutely nailed that segue. If you watch this channel, you'll love us on Main, where we do deep dives into the greatest cricket stories every week at Good Areas. How did Virat Kohli play that shot? What is so weird about Neil Wagner and explaining the incredible misery of being a New Zealand opening batter? Visit our Good Areas site today. Want to show the world that you not only love cricket, but that you know the game deeply. Well, you need a Bodyline t-shirt. In fact, at Bodyline t-shirts, you can actually buy a t-shirt about Bodyline, but also tees inspired by the greatest players in our game. Head to Bodyline t-shirts today. All right, welcome back. Uh, let's get to Rudra's question, which I've now, of course, lost. England are probably in the top four test teams, but they are eighth in the World Test Championship. Without the slow over rates, they would be at least sixth. Will the slow over rate point deductions prevent Wagnerian bouncer tactics from becoming more prevalent or do the teams in general not care about all the WTC unless they think they have a realistic shot at the final um look I don't think it's the point where players are desperate for it I think you'll get certain player groups who might be like let's build towards this we've got a good draw you know we've got a bunch of good players at the moment let's go for it I don't think it was right at the form forefront of the baseball minds I think they were just trying to get in and play their best cricket uh, but you're right. I do think in the future it m might change that. It might just mean that teams rush through overs again. Um, that there's there's no reason to be as slow as we currently are. I don't think we ever want to get back to a point where like Mike Hussey is running between balls um, to bowl medium pace. But I also don't think we should be in a situation where teams need to discuss 30 second chats between each individual delivery. Um, let the bowler be the bowler. That is that's the game, right? Uh, but I do. I think this is all mute because I think we'll eventually have a ball clock anyway, which will probably solve a lot of these issues. Will says, how many more years do you think Anderson would have to bowl to break Murley's record, considering the likelihood that he'll play fewer games and take fewer wickets in them? Uh, over under on him needing three years. I think I'd have to have a look, but was he bowling? Is he taking around 30 to 40 wickets a year at the moment? Um and he's not going to play every test match. So, yeah, it's probably just over for a threes. But it, that's a pretty good money line, I think, Will, on that. Mystic Referee says, do cricket's natural and broadcast viewing angles make appreciating batting skills easier than bowling? Oh, I don't know about that. I, I think I, I think being right behind the bowler's arm gives you a good idea if the bowler's moving the ball laterally. We probably move. We probably miss things like dr drop and um, extra bounce and everything. And I think that's very, very fair. Um, but I'm not sure we don't miss things by not being side on to batters as well, understanding you know, individual things from that. So, no, I would say that we pretty much got the angles right. I don't think that means that there aren't other angles that we could have a look into. Uh, who was it? I can't remember. Was it the IPL or someone else? Big Bash World Cup or something. There was one year where every time there was a free hit, they would use a different angle. It was horrendous, and I hated it. Um, if you can come up with a better angle, I'm all for it. But so far, I think um, I think the, that angle makes the most sense. Christopher says, what country in the world would produce the most diverse cricket wickets? I imagine America, due to its size and climate, could produce such different wickets in, in different areas. I would assume Russia, right? Isn't Russia the biggest landmass of any country? Um, so, you know, I, I mean, I'm not an expert on Siberia, but I would assume Siberia is different than uh, other places near sort of Afghanistan and everywhere else. Um, but yeah, might might be America. Um, you've got, you know, probably dustier areas and grassy areas and, um, you know, the ball would certainly fly around in, in Denver and Utah, or a little bit like um, uh, Joe Berg. Uh, so uh, perhaps the USA is, an, is another one. Um, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Australia's a fairly big country, and yet 
the wickets are same e, not completely the same, but certainly same e. Um, and then you've got other places in the world where um, the wickets do seem to be quite different from uh, venue to venue, even in small areas. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I suppose America makes sense. Canada would be cold. Huh? Um, Brazil is Brazil another one as well. Um, I'm not an expert on topography. Do it, it, if that is the right word here, it may not be. Richard says I could potentially see England's batters doing okay in Australia the next time they're there, but I find it difficult to see how they would take 20 wickets. A problem that has really troubled them in India this year. What can England do to help themselves take 20 wickets more often? I know they did it in Pakistan, but surely they can't do that against Australia in Australia. Uh, I think they're doing all the tricks. It's I don't think there's any like. Like the, they have bas balled their bowling as best they can. They took a whole bunch of wickets out of two part time spinners and uh, the bouncers stuff they have tried to death and the funky fields and the in and out fields and all these different things that they've gone with the new fielding positions and you know daring people to sweep and putting a fielder back directly behind the spinner's arm rather than out at long on or long off. They've, they've tried all those things and and not to mention just Stokes' captaincy. At a certain point, they just have to get bowlers who perform overseas. I you know I don't think you can fake that. If we're being honest, um, Joffre Archer would help. Ben says, "Great to see Cool Deep doing well. There's something mystical about left arm wrist spin. The sex appeal of leggies with extra rareness. He's a little bit thirsty there, Ben. I do want to know that he simply won't get picked away from India. If they didn't pick um, Ashwin away from home, which always seemed crazy, just pick three seamers and two spinners. It seems unlikely they'll pick Cool Deep. I could see. Um, I can certainly see Cool Deep." Um, playing in perhaps someone like Australia where Rispin will help. But I think you're right. Unless they play um, Judasia as the, just their fourth bowler and away from home, you would only do that in Asia. I, I can't see them really going in with with that lineup all that much. But they might think that Cool Deep and Shadul together, or as I think I said the other day, Cool Deep and um, uh, Hardik is probably the the, the option that I really like, I could see that working. But yes, if you're talking about them having four frontline bowlers and Cool Deep being one of them and the other three can't bat, then Cool Deep's batting isn't probably strong enough to be able to hold that together. So I do think there will be some issues. But I don't think that doesn't mean that they can't pick him for individual test matches. You know, let's say, I don't know, Adelaide and Sydney, for instance, and uh, I, there might be wickets in... I'm trying to think of a good wicket in South Africa for wrist spin, uh, wherever temporary Shamsi falls. Um, but you know what I mean? I do think there are locations, you know, Old Trafford, for instance, where they might want to do things like this. But I don't think he will ever be a consistent player away from home in the way he could be at home. Rem Kumar says, uh, since much of the selfish nature of players connected with cricket's history, tracking 50s and 100s and more averages, why don't we have more normalized averages where your score is normalized to the uh, difficulty, which is connected to pitch and opposition? Of course, match situation is another factor, but more subjective. Yeah, we already do this. <laughs> um, I don't, you know, we already have already started to factor this in. Um, teams do this. So England had their expected average, which is using tracking um, data to say, well, you know, there's an outswinger bolt at 90 miles an hour that is aimed at the top of off stump that jagged away. Um, uh, it was swung away and, uh, you know, that would average three and you're getting out to that, uh, ball a lot. Well, we expect you to get out to that ball. So they're already using that. Uh, we, you know, we, I think it was Joe Denley when we first found out that they were using all those sorts of things. Uh, we on this channel or, uh, and on the main YouTube channel, we use, um, uh, oh my God, I've now forgotten that era ratio and match ratio. So we're looking at the general average in that game. Can be a little bit warped by a few things. You know, we still have to kind of normalize things out. I'd like to still get to the point where we have contextual data. So like what we do in, in T20 cricket, for instance, where so a player comes out and the score is 20 for three. Uh, what is the expected runs of a player at 20 for three? And how many runs did that player actually go on to make uh, over the course of their career? Um, something that we're looking at a little bit for our book, but it is quite tough for some of those older players. Uh, yeah, so those are the f those are four that I can think of off the top of my head that people are already using. And we're not the only ones using them either. Other people are looking at them as well. Bloody says, are all major cricket boards non-profits? 
If they are nonprofits, do they all publish financial accounts and statements? Elephant in the room is the BCCI, but I'm not up to date with the current status uh, with them. Um, I believe all cricket boards are nonprofits. I, I stand corrected that there might be small and, uh, nations that I'm not aware of that aren't, but I would assume that they are all nonprofits. It is very, very rare for cricket boards to release their statements. I don't think it's acceptable. Uh, BCCI is certainly not the only one. There's a lot of them, and it does my head in. We don't really know. There, there's a list that goes around online every now and again of how much money each board is worth. And like they have like Zimbabwe listed as like the fourth richest board. It's something like that. It's something stupid. Like South Africa is really high. I can promise you that Zimbabwe and South Africa don't have any money, right? And there are other cricket boards that are low on that list that I think should be higher. Um, and yeah, so I don't really generally trust what the cricket boards have released when they have released stuff and they don't release it all the time. And uh, yeah, uh, it, I think it's an issue. It's our money. Every single person on this channel, it is our money. How do you think they made it off cricket fans? They should have the decency to let us know exactly how much of our money they have and how they are spending it, right? If you're a cricket fan of, I don't know, if you're a Brazilian cricket fan and you have to sign into a pay TV um, situation to be able to watch Pakistan play or India play or Australia play or whoever you like to play, you are still helping funding that, that cricket board, right? It's our money. And I don't think they treat it uh, with the respect that they should. I don't think they tr treat fans with the respect they should. Ben says, one of my favorite parts of the Moneyball book is the description of one of the players. Their weakness when hitting is right next to their biggest strength. Pitchers will try and aim for their weak error but miss and get hit. Does Duckett's weakness, his half-cut waft, being right next to um, a full cut, a full shot cut, cause problems for bowlers? Um, as an analyst, how would you tell your team to bowl to? I don't think his full cut is as full as you think it is, Ben, from my memory. I think it's always a bit angled back. So I don't have a huge issue with that. Um, I'm trying to think of another player. Uh, I think that Alistair Cook was a really good one because he had a bit of an angle bat when he defended the back of a length ball outside off stump. But he could also, if you got it slightly too straight, sweep that, uh, sweep that, pull that. And if you got it slightly too wide, he could play more of a full cut shot. So I think Alistair Cook is a good example of that. One of the, my favorites is um, Faf Duplessis, and I've now got to remember it. I think with Faf Duplessis that you wanted to bowl very, very full outside off stump. So oh, not quite a half volley, but just short, you know, that length, really, really good full length. But the problem with Faf Duplessis was if you got it too straight, he would just flick you to death away on the leg side over and over again. So, yeah, it, that's a quite a common thing. I do remember uh, working with Scotland and there was a player who, um, oh, my God, it's the guy from Bermuda who's really good who played for Sussex, whose name I'm just blanking on. But he had an issue with his game at that stage where you could actually bowl short and wide outside of stump to him. And he didn't really have a shot. And you could bowl so short and wide outside of stump that he would try and pull everything and quite often hit them straight up in the air. And I don't know if he still has that. This was you know, six years ago, whenever. And um, and the Scotland wouldn't bowl short and wide to him because it just it made no sense to them that you would do that. Like, a, you know, and I, and, and I, I had to leave that game because my, my son got ill. And afterwards, we were having a discussion, and they were like, yeah, well, what are we going to do? Bowl short my turn? And I was like, that's exactly what we had to do. But because I wasn't there, I couldn't pass on the message. And, and they, as cricketers, a bit like what you're saying here, Ben, went, well, we can't do that. He'll just play a normal cut shot. But not all players can play those shots. But, yeah, I do think in Duckett's case, it's a bit more of a, um, a half cut. It's more of a stabby angled cut, if that makes sense. It's very, it's very rare now to see a player play a full Robin Smith type cut shot, Steve Waugh type cut shot. They, not many of them left in the game. Um, bowlers are just too accurate. And so many bowlers come from wider of the crease. Now, you don't get the kind of... Bowlers used to come from close to the crease. So they would, if they got it a little bit wrong with their line, it would go wide. And, of course, bowlers used to bowl more outswing as well. So it would come up, sometimes swing into that slot. It's very rare to get that kind of width anymore. Mystic says, do cricket's natural... Oh, we've done that one. Ali says... Why didn't cricket pick up in places like Egypt and Iraq, despite the presence of some military, a British military there? So I think the first thing that you need to know is it's not just having British military, right? It is it is really how long they stay there and what their role is within that country. Um, 
I don't, th- I, I'm not an expert on how long they were in those two particular countries, but my memory is that they probably weren't in Iraq long enough to have a, a big impact on cricket being played there. It's, uh, there's also, perhaps you could make an uh, argument, maybe those two places are too hot. I don't know how much hotter they are than, you know, Western Australia or Pakistan or, you know, uh, India, but they do look like two hot places. Um, I haven't been to either of them, so I can't help you there. But, um, but yeah, I think it, it, it really de- depends on what the Britain's role was within those countries. Um, and then you've got to remember from 1910 onwards, it's an empire sport. So even if they were playing cricket, they would have had an issue. Um, and so we also, you know, Argentina is the best example of this, right? Of uh, once England's no longer involved with Argentina, uh, then you certainly get a situation in the future where cricket just dies there. And cricket was big in Argentina, right? There's no real reason for it to have disappeared. Uh, but yeah, I'm, uh, you might need to, I don't even know who would be an expert on that. Um, but yeah, I think that might be a question beyond my pay grade. Uh, but it's a very, very good one. Um, uh, quick break here. And then after the break, we'll be back with more Wagon Wheel. Support us on Patreon and help us keep making our content. Join for exclusive perks like the AMAs, the live calls, and to chat with me directly on Discord. You can also enjoy ad-free content, early podcasts, and access to my emailer. Step up your cricket-style game with Bodyline t-shirts. Explore their exclusive player-themed t-shirts, including favorites like Virat Kohli, Kane Williamson, and Ben Stokes. They also have team-inspired designs and options for hardcore cricket nerds. Their collection offers something unique for every fan. All right, welcome back. William says, I stumbled across a video of the 1976-77 Gillette Cup semi-final between WA and Queensland and saw Viv Richards play. Was it normal for players to play domestic cricket outside of their home country and England? If so, when and why did it stop? Uh, so you did get some in Australia, uh, Joel Garner, Imran Khan, uh, right up until Eunice Khan, Andy Flower, but it was very rare. And in Australian cricket, it was quite often frowned upon. Um, I don't, I think it, my memory is New South Wales never really liked it. It was really hard for Victoria. I remember one year Victoria weren't making any runs. There was a young guy called Paul Collingwood, absolutely dominating district cricket. And a lot of people were saying, why don't we just pick him? He's making runs. Um, and Bill Laurie being really angry at the idea of it. And I'm trying to think if Victoria, I don't think Victoria did it until they had a big bash. So Victoria, I don't think did it. New South Wales didn't do it. I want to say Ghana played for Tasmania. Andy Flower and Eunice Khan both played for South Australia. Barry Richards played for South Australia. Am I missing any others? Barry Richards played for Queensland. Um, I, I mentioned Imran Khan before. Um, yeah, you mentioned Viv Richards. There was a couple more in WA. Um, Vic Marks, I think, played in WA. They were struggling to find spinners um, uh, at that time. It, it probably w- what that was. But yeah, uh, so yes, it's uh, it it didn't it didn't happen all that often. We there were. There were times when players went in. So South Africa is another one that has had it. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other markets. South Africa, Australia, England. I would say that overseas players have played in New Zealand, but I don't think many big name players. And of course, there were, this is kind of before first class cricket, but there were. Indians and Pakistanis who played in Bangladesh. Certainly Pakistanis. I can't remember if Indians did. Um, so, yes. And I'm trying to think. There's something with Sri Lanka I'm missing as well. So, it's, it's happened occasionally that these things um, have uh, that these have occurred. It's kind of down to the finances, right? And, and what you're trying to get out of um, state cricket or, or domestic cricket or whatever it may be, league cricket, uh, and, and these sorts of things do pop up. There are probably... Um, there are, you know, in Melbourne club cricket, sometimes there are, you know, Tiller Crichton, Dilshan and Chris Gale play and all these sorts of things. So, and we know the same with USA um, club cricket as well. So when there's money and when there's a desire, but it wasn't, it wasn't like county cricket. It wasn't an automatic thing. Um, and county cricket probably had a longer history of it than anywhere else, just because a county cricket's older, but also there was money being made from county cricket at an early stage. And so you go back to your, uh, Billy Murdoch kind of era. That there was a lot of play, you know, players were already being paid to be professionals anyway. Um, and so it, it, I think it was a little bit different there than it was in other places. But it has, a, it has happened outside of county cricket. Uh, and is there a benefit to players choosing to play overseas? Yeah, it's why it still happens. So 
you know, you still get young English players trying to have a year in, in Australia or South Africa or New Zealand. It just develops the game better. You know, you, you talk to players who've played in both places, they'll tell you how much more rounded their game is. Um, you don't even have to play at the top level. A lot of it is just access to the wickets and the and the bowlers. And uh, if you're a batter, and you know um, the same the conditions. If you're if you're a bowler, you know just just dealing with that sort of stuff. So yeah, I I you know if you that look at Zach Crawley and look at what his dad did, right? Like his dad was literally trying to do that in a sort of you know a, a more funded uh, way, which was get him as rounded as he could as early as possible. And that was probably on the back of a lot of former England players telling him that's what he needed to do. Ubik says, is there any merit to the conspiracy theory that Victorian players are overlooked for test collection and New South Wales players are more preferred? Who is the unluckiest heel player not to have played more tests? Um, Matthew Innes, based on this question. Um, I think that Victoria is more interested in winning Shield finals and, and having a really good Shield team and having older players. And New South Wales is more uh, interested in how many Australian players that they will produce. There was probably some biases that swung too far in New South Wales time. Um, Victoria has more cricketers than New South Wales. I don't know if that's still the case, but it was certainly the case five or six years ago, more registered cricketers. If you want to know the real re I, I think Victoria shoots itself in the foot by having a district um, cricket competition and a sub-district co cricket competition in Melbourne. This is so inside baseball at this point, but I don't think it needs both. And I think so many times the best players aren't playing district cricket. They're off playing sub-district cricket for much bigger sums of money in what is, that's the league that Tiller Cratty played in. He didn't even play in the top level of Melbourne district cricket. I just think that's stupid. And I say that as a former sub-district player. Um, but, but yeah, I do think there's a mindset difference. Do you remember I, there was a few years ago when Victoria Cricket did this incredible thing where they just went, we don't have any fast bowlers. We're going to go out into club cricket and find fast bowlers. We don't care what what age they are, what their background in is, whatever. And I actually mentioned one of them today. Shane Harwood was one of those players. He was playing in Ballarat, um, obviously rough around the edges, but bowled 90 miles an hour in club cricket in Ballarat. Good luck to anyone going up in a club game against him. And Mick Lewis was another player that they found. And Mick Lewis, I might have told the story on Wagon Wheel before, but Mick Lewis, we played against him, I think, just after he got signed up for Northcote and was going to be, you know, it was going to be fast-tracked into the Victorian side. And he played against our second um, second 11 opener was uh, filling in for our first in a practice match. And Mick Lewis just started hitting him with the ball and then just walked down and said, I don't want to get you out. I just want to hit you as many times as I can. Um, I still remember the bruises on, on my friend's body. But... Um, that that's the sort of thing that probably New South Wales would never do. They would go look for the next 16 or 17 year old fast bowler, right? Who's going to be the next Australian bowler. Funnily enough, Dirk Nannis, Shane Harwood and Mick Lewis, who all picked in their late twenties, maybe even early thirties, um, all went on to play for Australia. So it does tell you that there is merit in the Victorian method, but it is very different. Um, Western Australia is probably the, if, if we're being really honest, Western Australia, I would say, historically is the team that's probably been the worst treated by selectors. Um, but because there's more players in Victoria than anywhere else, it probably feels like it should be Victoria. Um, I, I say this as a proud Victorian. I think New South Wales have just produced better test cricketers over a long period of time. Um, uh, and, okay, so the, the, the unlucky shield player not to have played more tests. Um, hmm. Yeah, I mean, Martin Love's pretty high on that. I mean, Matthew Elliott, I, I think I still think Matthew Elliott's one of the best batters I've ever seen. Um, he's probably in my top 100 best batters I've ever seen um, live. He's probably, he might be in my top 70 batters I've ever seen live and didn't play that many tests and fell apart kind of when he did. Um, so there's two. You could make an argument for Lehman in some ways as well. Um, then you've got the guys like Siddons and Law, who I think are just a step below but were fantastic. Uh, in terms of wicket keepers, there's probably dozens. Uh, and then uh, you've got uh, that sort of Matthew Innes, um, Stuart Clark type bowlers, perhaps uh, um, off the top of my head. I'm trying to think if there's any old. There's, uh, I think there's some older cricketers that probably missed out as well. Avanav Sharma says, "What England? What England played in India doesn't seem to be the typical baseball. They played with the attitude." Uh, 
they play with the attitude that there's one with your name on it. That's a level above baseball. They have this attitude even on Indian surfaces that aren't that bad. And even the English batters who aren't terrible players or spin seem to have this mentality. Do you agree? No. I think what they do, Abinav, I think you've slightly misread it. I think what England try and do is they they play they play in a way that let's say a bowler is bowling. Let's say Boomer is bowling really good channel outside of stump to Joe Root. And Joe Root realizes that Boomer can beat him on the outside and nick him off. That sort of Pat Cummins dismissal. Or can bring one back in and get him in trouble with LBW. And so what Root does is he goes, okay, I need to disrupt this ball so that you cannot bowl this line and length to me anymore. So I'm now going to reverse scoop it. That would might look to you like there's one with his name on it. What he's really saying is that I, that, that I don't have a great answer for this particular ball. So I'm going to make it so it is harder for him to bowl this ball with this field. In, in the next couple of deliveries in the next couple of overs and that's their style and that is typical baseball and that's exactly what they did in india so i don't think there's anything all that different that all that different i think that the issue is like look at the ben duckett dismissal against ashwin in that last test i understand why ben duckett was struggling with ashwin and i understand that he needed to do something different but i don't always think that their plan a when they're trying to disrupt is sensible or is repeatable. And I think that's what we're, some of us are talking about with this, this baseball theory, which is there's a lot to like about the way they play their cricket, but you can't just run down the wicket at, at, at Ashwin and assume it's going to be okay because it's probably not going to be. Patrick says, what can New Zealand's bowlers take from this series? The sweaters that they were given? Um, I, th I, I mean, they kept them kept them in the first test perhaps oh, look i thought sears looked okay i thought matt henry looked fantastic i'm, I'm a little bit worried about Southie, but it could just be that he's had a bit of a bad series and they need some other bowlers around them obviously if jameson was fit that would be great um but i i think sears is an okay what third or fourth best bowler maybe fifth or sixth best bowler um and Kugelin just probably isn't up to it, and some of the others just aren't up to it as well. Um, but they weren't smoked off the park outside of the Cameron Green innings, were they? Um, like, I suppose you could say the Mitch Marsh and, and Carey at the end as well. But uh, it just felt very Matt Henry dependent to me. NC says, is new ball spin underutilized? I think India underutilized it in this series against England. And that if that's why you've asked the question, then yes. Uh, I don't think it's underutilized overall. I think it the problem with using new ball spin in it in outside of Asia is that the minute you do it, you are damaging the ball and it's less likely to do anything for the seamers, which is when you're gonna that's what you need the new ball for. So that old idea of using the um, the part-time spinner for the first over in, in one day in, T, in T20 cricket, that was the bit that I never quite got my head around was, okay, so you've got your Tom Cooper over out for no runs or your Joe Root over out for no runs, but the ball's not going to swing as much now for the guys you want it to swing for. And that's the problem with using new ball spin. Uh, in Asia... I would say it's used pretty right. I mean, we've seen guys like Ashwin and Pereira be kind of near specialists with it. Um, so, so no, I, I think in general it's used a pretty good amount. There may be situations when you can use it more, um, but but overall I think it's fair enough. No one knows this. Is Australia the only team where players average more in test cricket than in first-class cricket? Because a lot of the Aussie batters average 35, 45 at shield and end up averaging 50 in test cricket. Um, Gilly Hussey Manus. I don't think Smudge. I don't think Steve Smith is one of them, is he? Uh, my memory was he had a fantastic first class record. Uh, it's interesting that you picked the other three because they're all late bloomers. And I think if you look at any late bloomer in the world, you are probably looking at a player who's going to have a lower first class average than a test average, right? That sort of, you know, the Mike, Michael Vaughan um, situation. Stephen Smith. I almost looked at a wicket keeper there. Um, so, yeah, so I do think there is 
uh, you know, when you look at it from that pers perspective, I, I get your point, but let me just look very, very quickly at Steve Smith's batting average for New South Wales. Because I would think that that is not the case. Because my memory is he made a lot of runs. Uh, oh, he's still averaging over 50, but yeah, it is lower than his overall average. Um, yeah, I mean, people would say that shield cricket is really tough, like players who play in it. So I asked David Hussey about this once, who obviously didn't go into play test cricket. And he said that counter cricket was as hard as test as first class cricket was. And I said, I'm not being rude or anything, but you average 45 playing for Victoria and you average 65 playing for Nottingham. I might be misremembering the numbers, but I think it was something like that. And he was like, yeah, no, I get your point. But the, one of the reasons you make more runs in counter cricket is the bowls are all tied because they're playing all the time. And in test in shield cricket, players play it like a test match. And so they really plan for each player individually a lot more and everything else. Um, so I think that is part of it. I would assume that it's not always the case. And there are probably periods when it happens more and periods when it doesn't happen. There was certainly a period in the nineties when all the, uh, there was a lot of players with very high averages. And I know some of those were backed up by their County stats um, as well. But so I do think it was a little bit different. I would say that England players probably, there's probably a few England players that do it. I think it depends on when you pick your players as well. If you're picking a lot of players around that peak batting age era. So, Look at look at Australia. Martin, Hayden, Langer, Hussey, Manus, Gilchrist, Hodge. I'm trying to think of some others. There's a lot of guys who kind of found their way in the team when they were between ages 28 and 32. Even if they tasted success, uh, even if they tasted international cricket beforehand, they probably came back in their peak era. And so if that's the case, that instead of, it's, you know, they're instead of doing what, um, although then that doesn't follow on as well. I'm trying to think of the logic there. Um, I don't know. I'd have to go through this to see if it even holds up. Um, it feels like it makes more sense to me off the top of, off the top of my head. Uh, he also, no one also asks, Mahinda Amanath averaged 30.44 in India, 30.42. I like the decimals and all this. 35 points. Um, uh, thirty point four two in England, thirty five point six. So he's taken a decimal off there. Interesting in New Zealand. Uh, however, he averaged fifty five point six six in Australia, fifty seven point oh six in Pakistan, and fifty four point eight one in West Indies. We've seen players who like pace and bounce, but I don't think, but don't like lateral movement like Virat Kohli. But even then, there was, but even then, he was great in Asia. I've never seen something as lopsided as this. No, I've never seen anything as lopsided as that in in terms of um, those countries. That doesn't mean that there isn't another player out there because, you know, we're going through the records of a lot of old batters at the moment. And so there might be other players with similar sorts of things. The only issue I would have with what you've said so far is that like New Zealand and uh, I'm missing this. In his record, New Zealand and England, he's played seven tests. Uh, that's still enough combined, though. Let's say that's 32.5. Okay, so he doesn't like the lateral moving ball. When does he play in the West Indies? 76. So he played in that first series. And when does he play against Australia? And how good are Australia? He plays against a pretty poor Australian team, doesn't he? Um so he plays against World Series cricket teams. Uh, and then he plays against that sort of week 1985, 1986 era. And then against the West Indies. God, he got a lot of starts against the West Indies. And only 200s. Um, does well. I does well against the 83 uh, West Indies. So it holds up a little bit more. Look, the truth is, it is. Sometimes when we look at these records, it could be small sample size. I would say that Pakistan, West Indies, and Australia are three places you do not get a lot of lateral movement, right? Whereas India, you get lateral movement with spin, although he should be better against that. I, don't, I can't understand where his record's so bad. And England and New Zealand, he doesn't get lateral movement. Oh, sorry, he gets a lot of lateral movement. So perhaps his problem was, and I... I haven't gone back to have a look at his, uh, you know, his full record or anything. 
Um, perhaps, perhaps it was something to do with the fact that he had an angled bat and that caused him issues, or there might be something else. Um, but it, that's a hard one for me to be able to say uh, without, because I need to look at highlights of him batting kind of on his dismissals and him scoring boundaries and everything else. But if you want me to make a very quick diagnosis, I would say it seems like there's an issue with him playing the ball when it's moving side to side. He doesn't mind extra bounce um, and and flatter pitches as, as much. Bob, Bobby O says, is form real or is it just a concept? It's just a concept, man. Um, no, I think I'm going to answer this in a really, really interesting way. I make scrambled eggs almost every day for myself and for my daughter. I'm really good at making scrambled eggs and I've been making scrambled eggs for 10 years. It's been cheese, a lot of spinach in my scrambled eggs. I know how to cook them. I buy the right pans for them. Uh, I found a perfect oil, groundnut oil, um, that, that makes them taste exactly how I want. There are probably periods that I go through where I cook scrambled eggs perfectly day after day after day. And then there's other days when I overcook them or undercook them. All right. When I get the cheese content wrong, uh, when I haven't noticed that there's a small egg and that's uh, put off my, uh, put off my, um, uh, uh, recipe, all these sorts of things, right? There's form in everything. So I can't see how cricket would be any different than that. You know, sometimes you just feel more comfortable in your body. Um, yeah, if you're a fast bowler, sometimes the bits that usually hurt on your body don't hurt. If you're a batter, sometimes you're just looking at the things you should be looking at rather than the things that you shouldn't be looking at. I think all those things matter in every part of life all the way through, whether it be making scrambled eggs or you know, facing a fast bowler. So I do think form comes in. And then after a while, if you're nailing it time after time, you do feel more confident which allows you to be more successful. And then one day you put a lot of shell in the egg and then you lose your 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 will, right? Or your your um, confidence a little bit. So I do think that those, those things exist. Um, there was a thing in basketball years ago where they thought the hot hand fallacy uh, and they talked about the fact that if someone hits two three-pointers in a row, I think it was three-pointers, the idea was that you would feed that person the ball over and over again that night. And someone came out with analysis that said that didn't make any sense and here's why it didn't work. I believe there's been more analysis done on that since that actually now suggests that is a thing and that you should do that. And I don't think that means you should, if someone misses two, three, three pointers, you shouldn't give it to them. Or someone goes out twice in a row that you shouldn't bat them higher up in the order. But I, I do think in certain situations, form and confidence do matter because a form is really the stringing together of a bunch of, of you doing the same thing correctly a bunch of times until you feel a little bit better about it than the other times when you're not doing that. Uh, that is the end of the Patreon questions, but I could see that there's a bunch of super chats here that I will try and get to as well. Uh, so I won't even take a break. I'll go straight into them because there's a few. Uh, oh, it only helps if I take the other question off the screen though, doesn't it? Double questions. That's how we do it here on Wagon Wheel. Nikhil says, guys, love your work. Thank you very much, Nikhil. And thank you for the um, uh, uh, super chat. Do you think media hype of baseball is distracted and put added pressure for players uh, to play for the galleries? <laughs> no, not at all. Um, they put their own pressure on. They said ridiculous things over and over and over again. Um, you say Jimmy talking nonsense in the press conference is not him naturally. That I think that is Jimmy Anderson, actually. I do think that is Jimmy Anderson's normal state. I think England had kind of tried to stop him from being that kind of person for many, many years. Um, but I do think Jimmy Anderson's natural state. Ask any player who's played against Jimmy Anderson whether what he said in press conferences is his natural state or not. So, no, I, I think the opposite, Nikhil. I think they put pressure on themselves by telling people that they were going to change the game. They were entertainers. Um, and it didn't matter if they lost, like all those sorts of things put undue pressure on themselves. And, you know, look at the, some of the things that Ben Duckett and Ollie Robinson have been saying, you know, that that's who those two people are. And so I really think that they've been let off the chain, uh, by the management to be the exact kinds of people they are. And, um, you know, you know, and sometimes when you, when you think about, um, what's the best way of putting it? Sometimes. <laughs> We don't always get players. If, if you look at Ben Duckett since he's come back from baseball, I would say that that is Pen, Ben Duckett in pure form. I think if you looked at Ben Duckett when he played in 2016, he's a bit younger then, and so it is a little bit different. But I, I don't think that was, they wouldn't have allowed Ben Duckett to say the things that he would have said. So I do think there is a big, big change when it comes to that. But thank you very Oh, you've got another super chat. Double, double dip. 
Uh, he doesn't believe in the super chat as much. I can see he hasn't spent as much money on it. But <laughs> thanks again, Nikhil. Do England players pulling out, being pulled out a year and uh, out from the IPL post auction, affect their credibility price for the future? Piss off owners. Um, it's interesting because I've heard this before when it comes to England players, and yet Australian players do this, and I've never heard it be an issue. So I don't know why there's kind of a a bias there. I don't know if that's just the you know colonial mindset type thing of 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 you know stuff them their English where uh, and Australian players can do it. Look, it does. But at the end of the day, if your skill set, if two owners want you and your skill set is in demand, it doesn't matter, right? That's probably only going to matter, Nikhil, when only one team wants you. But if it's two teams who want you and they want you and they need you, I don't think that matters as much. Um, you know, I think now also the IPL teams are understanding that I think until the IPL takes over cricket, there has to be an understanding that sometimes players are just going to pull out just because it's not in their best interest. Um, and sometimes, and, and, and they have to do that. That might annoy that particular owner, but doesn't mean that another owner may not still look into them. But these are these are players who play a lot of cricket, and so there there is always going to be an issue there. And and some players are just going to have to give themselves a rest. Naveen says, watching Ashwin's vlog, he mentioned the height difference between Crawley and Duckett. One preferring to play in the back foot and the other front foot. How much harder does this make the bowler's job? So Naveen, if you go in, we talked about this on. Um... Now, what video was it? I think it was the video on Duckett, mate. It's on the main channel, the the rogue opener one. Uh, it does make it very, very tough. I was talking about it more from a seam bowler's perspective. perspective. Um, but Duckett and Crawley being so different, I don't know if you could come up with too many better opening partnerships in terms of height, style, and um, handedness. Like, it's almost a perfect partnership from that perspective. It really is made to put you off. Um you know, but bowlers will say right hand, left hand, we kind of bowl against that enough. We can handle that. Some younger bowlers don't. Some swing bowlers struggle with it a little bit more, but generally do, people, bowlers can do that. But length as well, and such a, a, a very different kind of length that you need to bowl to each of them, that gets a little bit trickier. Then you've got, then you've got their overall styles as well, you know, of, of where they can punish you. So yeah, I do think it's a really, really, um, uh, interesting one to talk about and you know we, it, it's we haven't had a lot of very tall batters this is the first generation really where we've had consistently like lots of tall batters coming through and so it isn't something that we have always talked about but it, it's something that you know doing the research for my book you, re you really do start to realize how much it plays with bowlers minds uh rupesh says has any batter found a reliable way to handle the wobble ball like martin crow did against reverse swing yeah the averages have gone back up rupesh and it's really, as far as I could tell, it's really it's a combination of uh, Daryl Mitchell and England and maybe the Pakistani batters. I'm just working out that if you just mix your um, uh, positions on, on the wicket up, that's what stuffs the wobble ball up, right? So the wobble ball at its absolute best, you want to bowl it really, really full. So it's hitting the top of the stumps. Daryl Mitchell takes a shuffle down the wicket. You're, that length now is right in his hitting zone, right? Ollie Pope takes a couple of shuffles down. Uh, we've seen uh, Joe Root sometimes bat a meter out of his crease, sometimes bat completely within his crease. That's essentially what players have done to negate the wobble ball. Uh, and I know there was some panic that like it was going to ruin cricket forever, but generally that's what, what ha batters are, are good at working the, these things out. And guess what bowlers do? They'll work out their next trick. doesn't mean the, the wobble ball is not still really good. Like reverse swing is still really good. The wobble ball will, will not go away. Like the wrong end never went away. Right. But there was a period of time where, where, cricket media was saying and the cricket establishment was saying that that the wrong one was so potent that it was ruining cricket reverse swing wobble ball all these things eventually batters find a way uh ashwin says growing up gibbs was one of my favorite players what is his legacy in tests from his home and away numbers it seems like he was a quality opener his his record as an opener is fantastic and i don't know herschel very well i've had a couple of chats with him when i was in south africa commentating a couple of years ago um, I'd love to get him on the podcast and really dive into his test career because his numbers as an opener certainly suggest that he was underrated and he did bounce around the order quite a bit. So I'd like to know if he just played as an opener when he, he understood his game more or 
a little bit like someone like Duckett. He was just such a natural striker of the ball that he could put pressure back on the bowlers and 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 it helped him as an opener. His legacy in Tests is that he's largely forgotten, which I think is a bit of a shame. I do think he was a much better player than we remember in Test cricket, and I think he's thought of as more of a one day cricketer, which is a shame because his legacy in one day cricket is also um, a little bit uh, different. Um, uh, so yes, uh, I, I'm very, I'm, I think I'm much higher on the the general population. I don't know how many people in the population ever talk about Herschel Gibbs anymore, but I think I'm much higher on Herschel Gibbs than most uh, fans are. So um says. The money I'd pay to see a Kimber Ashwin collab. You know, uh, we will. I'm sure one of us will get the other one on a podcast soon. Um, I'll, I'll talk to his uh, um, his wife and and him directly. And I think I've got his WhatsApp, actually. I'll probably just send him a message. Um, it's just every time I go to message him, India's playing another series and he's busy. And, uh, you know, it, we, had, we had a couple of players. In fact, we've got a player who's supposed to be on the podcast soon who's busy at the moment who completely missed um, a slot. We had Kumar Sangakkara on and he had meetings and everything else. We had another player who it took me like four days to get them on the show a while back. Um, the reason I don't get more players on, it's just that it takes so much of our time. I love to talk to players more. And obviously I've got a lot of friends who are players and players who watch some of these videos as well. And um, more watch probably than what's on the main channel than the, the stuff over here. Although there are players who, who come over here as well. Um, it's just a timing thing. They very, they're very not. It's not like office jobs, and it's not like they're in the media and they're well organized with their times and everything. And you know, quite often they'll book a time with me, and then be like, "Actually, I have training all that day," you know, um, or actually we're flying that day, and I, I didn't look. That's why we don't get more on. But yes, I'm sure one day, one one direction or another, um, you know, I I've talked to you know him about setting up a proper network around him, um, and and I would. Definitely like to do that again. I think he's a fantastic. Um, I, I think he's fantastic speaking about cricket. Forgetting the fact he's good, good at cricket, and anyone who's good at talking about cricket, I usually want to chat to. Rupesh says, "You said BBL teams aren't allowed to use shield contracts to hire players to unfor uh, to avoid unfair competition in single or do double city teams, or something like that." I didn't understand it. Okay, so when the Big Bash came in, there were two teams in Sydney and there were two teams in Melbourne, and every other team had a single lineup which meant that if you were playing for Adelaide, it was very easy for the South Australian team to be like, we will give you a bigger shield contract as long as you also agree to play for our big bash team, which allowed then for you to have a better big bash team without having to pay the players, which meant that Melbourne and Sydney didn't have that availability because they couldn't bring their contracts together. And so what the Perth Scorchers did, and they weren't the only team, but they did it better than everyone else, which is why I wrote about them, is they basically went to all their players and, and said, if you still have hopes of playing for our Shield team, you have to sign for this team. And in some situations, players didn't, and there were huge issues, and I heard stories about agents being screamed at and players being abused and all sorts of things. So there were big issues. And, and it's just about the fairness of the Big Bash, right? And, it, and it's hilarious, because to go back to that question that we had earlier, generally, everything runs through Melbourne and Sydney. So Melbourne and Sydney have always had this advantage, and they tried to go against it. And so when I wrote the article, there were lots of fans from Perth, quite rightly saying, I mean, I mentioned it in the article even before they said it, but they didn't read that far, um, was that, uh, was that oh, wait a minute, everything, you know, we've always had everything against us. We finally have something in our favor, and that's fine. My point was that Justin Langer was at that, I thought was going to be the next coach of Australia. Maybe he already was coach. I can't remember when I wrote the article. And and part of his record um, was on the back of the fact that uh, Perth Scorchers had done really, really good. But Perth Scorchers had done really, really good because Andrew Ty was offered a contract that was more money than he would have got paid to play for the Perth Scorchers elsewhere, and he didn't take it. And when I started scratching the surface, there were many other players that did the same thing. And Darcy Short's contract was certainly one that was contentious within the Western Australian um, Shield setup. And there were others, even smaller players that you don't even know about, right? So, so you had a system that was supposed to be fair for the Big Bash and one particular, oh, sorry, and, and four teams were quite rightfully, and I don't blame the teams for this. I don't even blame Justin Langer for this. They were exploiting the system and doing what they could. And Cricket Australia knew they were doing it, had a rule to prevent it, and weren't doing anything about it. And then Justin Langer was looking like a much better coach than perhaps he was on the back of this. And I just thought the whole thing was ridiculous, right? 
Like, why even have the rule in the first place if you're not going to uh, be involved with it? It's especially because it, it, most of the I had two major leaks for that story. Well, three major leaks for that story. One was the players from the uh, players and coaches from Sydney, and uh, or mostly the, the support staff from Sydney and Melbourne teams, which it makes fine. Push them to the side because they would be biased. The other major leak was people from Cricket Australia so happy that I was writing about this. And I was like, well, then why don't you just do something about it? And the third major leaks were people from Western Australia going, yeah, we are doing this. Well, yeah, it's great, isn't it? Which I thought was quite kind of funny. Natash says, with Australia at its best, uh, with Australia at its best, who, uh, who are consistently the second best team in cricket across eras and formats? Records say South Africa, but no trophies. India have great success. Uh, but still not that many trophies. Uh, if you're looking at, at West Indies, it's probably still the second best team. If if you Because you've mentioned the trophies a couple of times. Um, South Africa would probably be the best team if there's no trophies and India maybe the fighting with West Indies for second or third. Uh, but if you're, if you're factoring in trophies the way that you are, um, then it would have to be the West Indies, right? Uh, what, four World Cup wins um, and one of the greatest test runs if not the greatest test run of all time, one of the greatest sports runs of all time. Um, so those would be the ones off the top of my head uh, that make the most sense. A, B, C, D, E, F says, where would you rank Harmapreet's 171 against Australia, the greatest by an Indian? Uh, and were the other IPL and other leagues always coming or was Lalit Modi a pioneer? Oh, that's interesting. Uh, Harmapreet, I think there's an element of like, sl like, and I was at that game, of like sloggy luckiness about it. Um, and I it wasn't at Capital Dev's innings, but I have seen great innings by other Indian players. And so, as as much I like, it, I, I so I don't think I would have Harman Preet massively above other innings. But the impact it's had on the game m might be as big as any innings by any Indian player ever. Uh, and were the IPL and other leagues always coming? It was like Modi pioneer. Uh, he's certainly a pioneer, but was it going to come anyway? No, I think it was going to come anyway. I think people who were just starting to work it out, whether it would have, I think you needed a cricket board to do it properly, which I suppose the um, ICL proved. Um, but I do think you needed a cricket board. So maybe the combination of Lalit Modi being with a cricket board was the other thing. But I know that other people had talked about similar kinds of things and there was a feeling of a more club-based model. But I do think Lalit Modi's understanding of India and franchise sports in America and Premier League, I suppose, as well, and, and, and football, was a really, really important part. I think that's fair. Um, Samit. Oh, my God. I'm going to have to find Samit's one. I know. Uh, where is Samit? Here we go. I'll find that. I'll get to that one later. Uh, Shrikant says, how do you rate the English spinners of the 50s? Like a Wardle Appleyard. Well, Appleyard's not a spinner. But I love that you put him in there. Incredible averages, but likely flattering due to the dust bowls of the time. Well, they wouldn't have played on many dust bowls, mate. Um, they would have played on uncovered wickets. Uh, I think w w Wardle could bowl international quality finger spin and wrist spin, and bowl wrist spin in Australia and finger spin in, in um, England. So I think we know he's an incredible talent. Laker was a very, very fast for his era, accurate spinner, and then on on you know, uncovered wickets could just be unplayable. So I think he was definitely a genius. And Apple Yard was a fast bowler who bowled spin. Basically, Mustafiza, right? 60, 70 years before his time. If Apple Yard's body doesn't fall apart, and it's funny that you talk about the dust bowls because Apple Yard wouldn't have played on many dust bowls. He would have mostly played on semen wickets. Uh, but he was absolutely uh, an incredible bowler. So I think I know less about Wardle than the other two. I have no qualms saying that Laker was was a fantastic bowler and was a great bowler. And I think Apple Yard, I think if Yap, Apple Yard's body didn't fall apart, and one day I'll do a video on him because he's one of the most interesting cricketers of all time. But I think if his body didn't fall apart, he could have been a genuinely game-changing cricketer. Could have changed the sport forever. Um, and unfortunately, just his body, just he, he got sick and physically and everything. And, um, you know, I've mentioned him in, in one of my videos before, um, but, you know, haven't gone all the way in on him. Nikhil says, another one from Nikhil. With Rohit maturing later, uh, will Rohit maturing later affect his status as a great? Yes. Is he likely to only end up playing less than 85 test matches? Yeah, probably, right? Um, uh, I don't think he'll play much more than that just because, you know, he'll, I think he'll get to an age where um, he will move on. Uh, but yes, it will affect his legacy. 
you know, with people like me, really, who go through, you know, with a fine tooth comb. Um, I did this on someone else's podcast the other day, but they got they got me to come on and explain my um, how we were doing the best test batters of all time. Matthew Hayden's a perfect example. There's, that seven year period of Matthew Hayden is phenomenal, right? And you can make a case based on that alone, especially for an opening batter of being one of the 20 best players of all time. Forget the fact that he struggled in England and, and you know, and everything. You could make a genuine case for Matthew Hayden to be one of the 20 best batters of all time. But he didn't have to bat all the way through his 20s when he was struggling, right? And he was in and out the side, and we know he wasn't very good at times. We know he had to go and develop himself. So how does that rate compared to another player who averages maybe three less but had to go through all the hard times as well in the national spotlight, you know, dealing with things and everything else. And Rohit's the same. Doesn't mean that those two players are not absolutely fantastic. And I'm, I love watching both of them and, you know, huge fans of both of them. Um, but it does mean that when you're talking legacy, it does affect those things. And I think I think that's a, a fair and reasonable way of, of looking at those sorts of things. And as I've said, you know, many, many times before, it's nitpicking, right? But when we get to... When we get to legacy and uh, and everything else, that's kind of what we that's kind of what we do. Samid so says New Zealand's record at home and away against Australia and South Africa is abysmal. Yep, even uh, strong New Zealand sides against poorer South Africa and Australian sides. Yep, is there a reason for that? If it's away, there would be a reason for it. The fact that it happens at home as well, I don't know. I think if you were to genuinely go through which is the smartest of those three nations tactically and the way they go through it, I think you'd have to have South Africa first. And so is it just that the other team has bigger, faster bowlers and, you know, more more batting talent available? But then what about, as you said, when New Zealand has strong sides? That's the bit I don't understand. New Zealand have never run the table when, even when they've been better than those other two sides. Um, I mean, imagine what would have happened if they, if they had lost that test, that second test to South Africa, um, that South Africa F side, right? Like, crazy I, I can't i i can't answer it because if it was a way like pakistan struggling in south africa or in australia i'm like that's fine that i can get i can't get this i don't know how to answer it uh, and the last super chat for the day is from keshuf who says this was just the second away test series win for australia in eight years does that blemish the fact that they have been really good test team including wtc holders i think it's hot, i think someone was saying the other day I think, you know, you have S tier sides, A tier sides, and, you know, you know, maybe B tier sides. I think that probably puts them at the very top of the B rather than A. Um, I think that's fair. They've had a couple of really good draws, of course, away from home, like that they should have, they, you know, that well, certainly 2019, they should have won. Um, but yes, I think you're right overall um, that they probably haven't won as much away from home as they should have. Uh, and it's interesting because I kind of feel like they're about to get a little bit worse. I, but but I do think that they're a decent side still. And, you know, I, I think pound for pound, I like India's team more and, and have for a while. I just didn't have more options. But, you know, Australia did win the World Test Championship and and, we'll, and maybe over the next year and a half, we'll see, uh, or the next summer, we'll see um, what the Australian summer, we'll see what the situation there is. Um, but, you know, India going and beating them at home, um, I think it, kind of puts them where i think they are if if out of those teams i think an india should be the a tier team um but maybe they need one more big win to completely cement that i'm not sure but yeah uh i so i think australia is a flawed team um and have been for quite a while but they are a flawed team with decent enough batting and rounded enough bowling that they can always get away with it and adding all rounders as they have recently is handy uh, Sega says, last super chat, why don't left arm orthodox bowlers come up with more variations like right arm offies? Because they don't have to. Their best ball works to, what, 70% of batters automatically. So I had an international off spinner come to me and ask me this question. And I said to him, exactly what I just said to you, Sega, that they are, it's basically, it's, it, I don't want to say left-handers are lazy because that's the wrong way of putting it, but I do mean they're lazy in that they have such an advantage. Why do left-arm seam bowlers so rarely swing the ball in both directions and right-arm seam bowlers do? It's because they don't have to. A, 
A left arm swing bowler can swing the ball back into right handers from that angle and create all sorts of problems. And that same ball swings away from left handers, which causes all sorts of problems. A left arm finger spinner gets to come around the wicket, dump the ball on middle stump, and then re- and spin it away, giving them a chance of bold LBW, caught behind, caught slip at all times, and a little bit of inside edge onto um, in- into short leg. To a left hander, they struggle until the footmarks come in, and then suddenly they can also bowl at the end of games to left handers as well. Off spinners have almost none of those advantages. So I think that is the main reason why uh, why left handers don't evolve as rounded games as right handers. If you're a right arm off spinner, right, you have to be like a Graham Swan level off spinner, right, in order to have a career at the professional level. If you're a left arm finger spinner, you don't have to be anywhere near as talented as Graham Swan to be a really good player at, at international level. Now there are fewer left handers and you know, being left hand dominant, not there's you know a bunch of different things that come in there. But that is that is the main reason for these differences. But that's me for today. Thank you, Sega and to Samit and Nikhil and A B C D and Natesh and everyone on Patreon as well. Um, and everyone else I've missed in here just now. No one did. No one come in. I think there was a no one one. Naveen, Naveen came in. That's right. Uh, but big thanks to everyone for supporting us. So many questions. Or where I, I don't know if I'm going to have to cut wagon wheel in half or, or work something else. But um, it, it's it's so great that you're asking so many questions. And I love the questions um, today again. And um, thank you so much to everyone for their support. Uh, we've got a bunch of videos coming out on the main channel. Um, if you haven't seen them, uh, the podcasts with Kumar Sankikara and Daniel McGehee are two of my favorites that we've ever done on this on this channel so check them out as well plenty more to come we'll be pivoting towards the ipl soon but we've got a couple of other videos to come out and it'll be kind of ipl into the world cup for us so three months of t20 cricket and then we'll uh, go into the england um summer and and take it from there um just you know it's one ball at a time it's it's never one ball at a time i usually as anyone who's been here before will know it's about 30 balls at a time uh but thank you very much for listening and watching wagon wheel and we will be back again next time Thanks to the kind folks at FlexiSpot for looking after my office and my butt by sending me their E7 Pro desk that save your favorite desk heights at a touch of a button. You don't have to crank anything. This thing just finds the height that you like and you can work. And their BS12 Pro chair that supports my posterior while I'm recording, well, this ad and all my shows. If you need great desks, especially ones that change heights or the best quality chairs, head on over to FlexiSpot today.